Well, welcome uh, our, to our online audience. We're so glad you're with us today and, and here in this time together. Um, you know, as we hear this uh, from the kids, such a great reminder, like to step back in from this season of busyness, of consumerism, of all of the overwhelm and stress that our culture can just constantly throw at us. Um, our culture is constantly pushing at us like the next purchase or the, the greatest gift you need need um, or the the newest thing that as we enter into the season and and Pastor Keith has challenged us this year he said what would it be like for us to step back and enter into this Advent season the way Christ did incarnationally what would that be for us as a church body to step back and go, Lord, how can we enter the Christmas holiday more fully to worship fuller, to spend more time with him, to maybe step back from our push of gifts and, and all of the spending and say, Lord, how can we step back to give more? You know, this is something that uh, we are, we're asking the Lord about, and, and Pastor Keith challenged us in this season, and he said, what can we do to enter into this like Christ has? Can I challenge you? Can I challenge you to ask the Lord this season? Every year uh, with our family, this is something that we've done as a family, yeah. and said, you know, kids, we want to enter this intentionally. We want to enter into Christmas intentionally. So let's pray as a family to see how we can do that. Who would the Lord put on your heart? Or how might you be a part of some of the things that are happening here? Maybe we can worship more fully in coming into the presence and into the church body and worship together. Or maybe the Lord's challenging you to give and to give in a financial way, maybe at the Christmas Eve offering or in our community. How is the Lord inviting you into this season? Can you join me in just praying through that as a family this year and asking the Lord, how can I enter into this season intentionally? You know, one of the things I love about Christmas is all of the holiday traditions. How many of you guys have holiday traditions that, oh yeah, I see lots of hands. Like, you know, you've got to go to so-and-so's house or drink this eggnog or, right? Our kids this year, after Thanksgiving, I mean, the first thing you want to do, we got to get the tree up and get it decorated. And so we're pulling out, like, all of these boxes from the garage with all of these old, like, homemade ornaments or Sunday school ornaments. And they have all these opinions now as young adults as to how oh, yeah. to decorate the tree, right? <laughs> I know. For the first eight years, you know, when, when they were with us, the tree was really well decorated from about three feet up right? That, that edge right there. Everything up above was not decorated because they just couldn't reach high enough. But they had a lot of opinions then too. So after, after they went to bed, you know, I'd have to go and kind of decorate the rest of the tree after they were asleep at night. But this year, you know, I'm just, as they're getting older, it's like I'm realizing soon they're going to have families and traditions of their own. And, and so there's parts of me that just, you know, like want to hold them on tighter a little bit. And and to make sure they know how much we love them. And I love that about this season, is that that is what Jesus did for us. That God the Father not only said he loves us, but he demonstrated it through the person of Jesus Christ. That he crossed time and space to enter into our world as a vulnerable child to live among us to be this fragile child that came into our world to be with us because he is a God that is for us. How appropriate for our pastor to reorientate us to this season of what it's really about, the wonder of Christmas, the advent, the coming of the Messiah, our hope, the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. It was the prophet Isaiah who spoke of the coming Messiah. And later, John, he writes these words that the word God became flesh. God put on flesh and he made his dwelling among us. It points to this extraordinary truth that God has come to be with his people. And that's just huge. 
that our God in heaven has come down to be with us, and that he is not just with us, he is for us. He is for us. Over the next few weeks, we're going to break down the name Emmanuel, God with us. And we're going to look at these different aspects of Emmanuel, that God not only is with us, God is for us, and God desires to work in and through us. And throughout the scriptures, you see this theme of God for us. As I was looking this week of of famous characters throughout the Bible, of, of Jacob and David and Paul, they say over and over throughout their lives that, that all the increase that I was given, all of the blessings that I was given, the way my life was transformed and I am a totally different person, it was no, no, none other than that I had a God that was for me. I had that a God that is for me. Paul most notably pins in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And, and the, the, the question is really, it tells you no one. No one can be against us if God is for us. And the power of this season is, is coming back to that that we have a God who is for us. Maybe today you've come in this morning and you're discouraged. You've received some bad news. Or maybe this season brings up anxiety for you or it brings up loss with the people that are no longer here. Or maybe you have just these tensions as family gathers and these dynamics that come out that are stressful. Or maybe you're grieving a decision you made. And I would suggest to you that if you've come today with those circumstances, you're here because this message is for you. That if you're in a battle, this message is for you. We're going to look today in scripture uh, about a famous story that I think ultimately tells us that God is for us. And we're going to look at some people who were up against some incredible odds. I mean, like there was no way that this was going to turn out good, but they experienced the promise of a God that is for us and things were never the same. Yeah, we want to take you to a story, uh, a passage of scripture that has so much to tell. I don't know about you, I need things tactile. I need them on the low shelf. I need them so I can touch them, smell them, taste them, feel them. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture uh, about a character, a character who's an unlikely character of Christmas. Uh, is, is a character, the, a story that tells us so much about what it is to walk and lead and live with a mindset that says that God is for us. That God becoming flesh and stepping into the landscape of human history, the story of what Christmas is about. But it's people like the main character in our story, reformers like the one we're going to look at, who made it possible so that the prophecies would be around to be told to people like the wise men. The wise men in Persia who would have been, who would have no reason to know except that there were reformers like the main character in our story who made sure that the prophecies about the Messiah would be passed on to the next generation. It was people like the main character who made sure that there were people, that there was a faithful remnant in Israel, people like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Anna and Simeon who were around to be able to recognize Messiah when he came. It was characters like the one that we're going to look at today that show us how it is that we walk and work and lead and live with a mindset that says that God is for us. What am I talking about? If you got a, if you got a Bible, open it up to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and while you're turning there, let me set the scene for you. I get it. Now some of you are like, wait a minute, hold on. 2 Chronicles is way like heck and gone from the New Testament. And you're right, it is. The year is about 860 BC. So it's about 800, almost 900 years before Christ's arrival, stepping into the landscape of human history. And before I go any further, I want to underscore to you just how much this has to do with us understanding that God is for us. 
He's an unlikely character, but this character absolutely helps set the stage so that people would be there to know the story. Uh, and, and to do it, to see it, we've got to go on an adventure. So who's ready for an adventure? Anybody ready for an adventure? Awesome. This section is ready for an adventure. The rest of you are surfing their wave right now. I'm just saying they're, they're, they're ready. So we're going to roll up our sleeves and let's dig into this. Uh, now, um, for most of us, the books of First and Second Chronicles in most English Bibles appear uh, as two different books, uh, as First and Second Chronicles. But in the Hebrew text, they are one book. It's one, one book with one contiguous story. Story. And in English Bibles, most of the time they appear after First and Second Kings. But in the Hebrew text, they appear at the end of the Hebrew Scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament. And they do that because what you find in First and Second Chronicles is a summary of all, essentially all, of the stories of, of Scripture. You find a massive summary of what's there, of who God is, of what he's for. In fact, the beginning of the book of uh, of Chronicles, actually the first word in Hebrew, it it begins with Adam, the very first word that you find uh, in the text. And it's fascinating to watch where, where this goes. And they were put there because actually it summarizes the scriptures because it's written after after Israel's exile to Babylon. So after David, after Solomon, after the nation split, 10 tribes in the north, two tribes in the south, good king, bad king, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, uh, more bad kings, a couple good kings, bad king, good king, bad king. After all of that, after all of that craziness, this book is written to help us see some things of who God is. And it's written to a post-exilic nation of Israel that is waiting for Messiah to arrive. They're waiting for things to happen and things aren't going the way that they want to be going. And so when we go into 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're dropping into the story of one of Judah's kings named Jehoshaphat. And it's been uh, the better part of like 80 years of bad kings doing dumb things, bad things, and the whole nation paying the price. And it's just been one nation after another that's risen up, and now there's all kinds of uh, what seemed like it was going to be peace, and now this giant force has come and invaded another place. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like a landscape that we know pretty well right now? There's instability, political instability, economic instability. There's all kinds of challenge. And Jehoshaphat has stepped into this and begun to make reforms. And things look like they're going well for a bit. And then out of nowhere, an enemy arises. And now King Jehoshaphat is faced with incredible challenge. And in the process, he tells us a whole lot about what it looks like to live and to lead as someone who understands God is for you. Look together, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. After this, after what? After all the reforms that Jehoshaphat has done, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Electricalites, the Termites, the Dynamites, the all the ites, and everybody and their mother's brother's cousin's former roommate has shown up to come against Judah. And even some of the Mayunites came against Jehoshaphat for a battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you. Then Jehoshaphat was, what's the next word? Afraid. Afraid. I love that the text shows us real people having real emotional responses. Jehoshaphat doesn't respond in some out-of-body thing. He responds with what we would all respond to in that moment, fear. He was afraid. But notice he doesn't stay there. Watch what happens. And he set his face to the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Notice the first thing that Jehoshaphat does. He sees what's coming against him. And rather than him just focusing there, he changes his focus and shows us what it looks like to live, to lead, and work, understanding that the God of creation is for us. How do we handle those moments? First thing, he shows us. Number one, we need to reorient. We need to reorientate our attention. He sees nothing but a horde. In fact, that's the text. The word uses in the text is a horde coming against him. You ever faced a horde? Yeah? How many of you right now would be honest enough? Come on, we haven't done mass confession in a long time. 
How many of you would say you're honest enough to say, you know what, I'm facing some impossibilities right now. I'm facing some impossibilities in my life. I'm facing some challenges that I don't have answers for, things, dynamics, situations where it feels like stuff is stacked against me. That's where Jehoshaphat is. He's in that moment. And rather than getting caught up on seeing what's there, he sees it, but the reality is he understands that when you have said yes to the God of creation, if you've said yes to Jesus Christ, then what you see is never all there is. Oh, come on. What you see is never all there is. When you've said yes to Jesus, you've said yes to an infinite God who is infinitely good, and of his goodness and mercy, there is no end. And it's never just what you see. There's always more. Which means it doesn't matter how dark the situation may be. It doesn't matter how difficult and and deep the valley may seem. God is always able to work. And Jehoshaphat shows us what it looks like to operate with that mentality. There's always more. Why? Because God, ontologically, that is, who he is in his state of being, is always infinite. There's always going to be more of him. Jehoshaphat remembers that God is huge, he's infinite, and that means that his focus can never be on just what he sees. There's a whole other reality, a realm that's there of his goodness and grace. And where does he go? He goes straight to prayer. Watch, verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court, and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. What's he doing? Jehoshaphat is rehearsing who he knows God to be. He's reorienting his attention, not on what he sees in front of him, but who God is. And I get it. Some of you may be like, well, hey, I haven't really seen this. I don't have this history or this tradition, but that doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change his capacity, his character, and his goodness, and his grace. You may not have experienced it as you see it, but that doesn't mean that he hasn't been consistent and faithful there all along. All along. And so Jehoshaphat reorients his attention and says, Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? He's recounting all of the stories that he has seen that have been handed down to him of what God has done. He reminds himself what he knows to be true. God, you're sovereign. And though I may feel like I'm outgunned, I'm outflanked, I'm outnumbered on every side, this is not all there is. And I can't help but think God's given us this word. I don't know if you can tell or not, but I got a fire in my belly. I believe God's given us a prophetic assignment. Because there are some of you who have been pushed back against the wall and the enemy is just trying to threaten you and intimidate you into non-action and God is saying to you, you are not alone. I have not lost your address. I've not lost your contact. Your phone doesn't need to be updated. I know exactly where you are. And we've been sent, commissioned by God to remind you, God is for you. He is for you. And you see this throughout the the characters in the Old Testament. You see when, when, when the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and when the church, the early church is against their, uh, is against their back, is against the wall, God moves them to a place of praying. And recently I was in, in a gathering of leaders in our movement and our president of our movement was making an observation. And he said, you know, when I look at the pages of Acts and I see the early church, the first century church, when I see their, their back is against the wall, you know what I notice about the early church? They don't pray for a different party to come into office. They don't pray for a new government to be put into place. They pray for the God of creation to come and do what only he can do. See, the New Testament church, the first century church, is a praying church. When I look at the 21st century North American church, we're a tweeting church. We're a texting church. We're a talking church. And you know, one of the things that I love so much about the region that we get to work in with our African brothers and sisters is they remind me with tears in their eyes as their backs are against the wall constantly over and over again. They remind us 
of the greatest resource that we have when we've said yes to Jesus Christ, that the greatest resource we have is that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And our back is never out of the game. It may look like it, it may feel like it, but he will have the final word. And the best thing that we can do in those moments is turn and pray. To do what the author of Hebrews tells us, to boldly come before the throne of grace and ask for mercy. And he tells, that's exactly what Jehoshaphat does. He tells what God has done in Israel's history. And watch what he does in verse 12. After he rehearses what God's done, he says, oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? What's he saying? God, would you deal with them? Would you deal with the enemy? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Notice he doesn't tell God what he has to do or the way he has. God, here's what you need to do. You need to take this person out of the cubicle next to me. You need to move them on. Lord, you need to deal with this person. You need to handle this situation. And this is the way you need. No, 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 no. There's none of that. He simply says, God, sick them. <laughs> sick them. You get them. I don't care how, but you do it. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. See, not only do we need to reorient, but secondly, we need to come with a mindset that says we can ask big. We can ask big because we have a big God. When you have a small God, you make small requests. When you have a big God, you can make big requests. God, would you come and would you move? We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We're trusting you. You've led us here, and God, every step we've taken is courtesy of your great grace. So we don't know how this is going to happen, but we know the one who does, and our eyes are on you. See, that's a prayer that comes from a mindset that says, God is not just with me. God is for me. He's for me, and I can lean into that goodness and that grace. I remember one of the ways that God made that clear to Nikki and me. Um, we, the, the year was 2000, and we had just stepped off of active duty in the Marine Corps. We'd come up uh, out of the tank battalion, and uh, the Lord had called us here to serve at East Hill. And so we said yes to being college pastor, worship leader, slash whatever you need me to be guy. We, we just said, sir, yes, we feel like God's called us here. And so we did. And we were living at my parents' house at the time because that's, you know, what every married family wants to experience. Um, <clears throat> it was great. No, my parents are awesome. It was fantastic. But it was hard. You know, you've been your own independent entity and then you come back home. Anyway, um, digging away. Um, love you, mom and dad. Um, so... <clears throat> We were there and we were trying to get into the housing market. And if any of you can remember way back 2000, um, back then the housing market was crazy. It was out of, out of control. And there was just like no way for us to be able to get into the market. And we, we worked with our real estate agent and she took us to a, a, a places all like a whole weekend. From dawn till dusk, we looked at places. And the places we were looking at, I mean, there's good places, there's bad places, and then there's like 250 feet of garbage, and then you've got what we were looking at down here. I mean, like seriously, there were houses that had nothing in them. They'd stripped every, uh, every uh, thing out of the, every, what, are you, what am I trying toilet, to say? Toilet, the yeah, sinks. Yeah, toilet, sinks, gone. tubs, everything was, every appliance was stripped out of the house. Some of the wiring was gone. It was going to cost like eighty, ninety thousand $90,000 just to get the place livable. And I'm like, this can't be what you've called us to, God. Um, and, and the real estate agent looked and said, look, I don't know how to tell you this, but this is as good as it gets. This is, this is going to be what it is. So you're just going to have to get, uh, get, adjust your mind to this reality. And it was, you remember this moment? Oh, yes, I do. It was one of these moments where all of a sudden God reminds me and gives me this gift of faith. And out of my belly came this, like, this indignant, like, no. And, and I, I looked at her and I said, you don't understand the God I serve. Every single place we've been stationed with the Marine Corps, every single place, God has supernaturally moved mountains to get us into exactly the right place. And my God is so good that he will turn this market upside down to put us precisely where he's called us to be. He's called us here, and God's going to provide, period. Yeah, I thought we were going to have to look for a new real estate agent after that, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was like, it was like dead silence. She just looked at me and was, okay, and we moved on. And you know what happened after that mighty statement of faith? Nothing. 
<laughs> Zero. Zilch. And I'm like, God, you gave me this big word of faith. And I stepped out and I look like an idiot. Um, what's going on? And, and like a week and a half goes by. And all of a sudden I get this phone call. And our real estate agent is on the phone. And, and I was like, hey, what's going on? She's like, okay, so here's the deal. You know, our house, was, our, 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 our real estate brokerage team here was having like a record year until we came to you. Since you said your little thing that you said, like nobody in our office has moved a single house. We've got to get you into a house now. We've got to end this because this is crazy. And literally, God moved mountains. And so she was the selling agent and the buying agent for a particular thing, worked it out. There were some gifts that came in, and all of a sudden, there was a house that we weren't even thinking about that was right around the corner from my parents' house, so far out of our range. I had such a small view of God, and God's like, oh, son, I've got so much more than what you think I do. And God moved the mountain, and, we were, and I remember the day we signed on the house and took possession of it, I, I looked at the house and have been in and out of it multiple times. I was like the, the nation of Israel around Jericho. I'm walking around this house. It's going to be mine. <laughs> and, and I looked, and I swear there was nothing, there was no door knocker on the door before. But the day we took possession of it, a knocker appeared on the house that said, welcome in the name of Christ. It's still on our door to remind me every time I come in, my God is for me. So that when I find myself in places where I don't understand the relational dynamics, where I don't understand what's happening, where I feel like my back is against the wall, I can remember that I have a God who's for me. And allow that to shape my perspective. And when that happens, anything is possible. Amen. That's a good word right there. Let's continue on in this story. Second Chronicles 20, verse 14. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. Verse 15, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They'll be climbing up on the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will, ha you will not have to fight this battle. Keep up your positions. Stand firm. See the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow. The Lord will be with you. Uh, that's just incredible. But how do you think that's just a little odd? Like, right, a little odd, like, battle strategy? I mean, the bad dudes are coming, and they're not just coming. They're coming in hordes, and God says, okay, here's my plan. They're coming up this pass. I'm going to have you all stand out here in formation, and I'm going to have you stand still and watch and see what I'm going to do. Okay, if you're like me, that would drive you just a little crazy. Like standing there and standing and this entire army coming at you and we're just gonna stand still. Uh, I'd be like, okay, Lord, I know there's some great battles like Jericho, right? Like they marched, like that, that whole, the whole nation got together and they marched around this city uh, one time a day for seven days or six days and then seven days. They marched seven times and they yelled and then God pushed the walls in. Or I'm thinking about like Gideon. He had this enormous army and it whittled it down. God whittled it down to 300 and they're sneaking up in the middle of the night, right? And they've got jars and they've got torches and they they break the torch and they break the jars and they yell and God wipes out the enemy but Jehoshaphat draws the card like no I want you to go out stand don't don't disguise yourself don't go don't don't uh you know just let them see you and stand there and see the salvation of God I would be a little bit nervous if I were them I would be like God I don't know about this um, that seems really odd, odd plan. I'm not a military strategist, but wow, that's an interesting idea. 
How many of you like me? Be like just impatient or are like thinking, God, you know, there's got to be more to this. I can't just stand there. Uh, sometimes when I'm wrestling uh, with something or, or concerned about something, I find great relief by like doing something. Like I've got to be doing something. Like we've got to be marching or we've got to be yelling or we've got to be doing something right here. And, and I get into this and I'm going and all of a sudden, you know, I realize this is not going the way I planned it to. Uh, this is not optimal. Um, there there's must be something I'm missing. And I come to the end of myself and I realize... I was thinking about this so much smaller than what you had in mind, God, hmm. right? That, that sometimes out of my own effort, that energy and my own strength, I'm working things out, I'm kicking down the doors, but it's not working because I'm not operating with God. You know, it was funny, I was, I was talking to uh, Jason and Ashley this week and just kind of asking them, you know, like, I mean, can you guys remember a time where I had a hard time waiting for something? And Jason did that, he rolled his eyes at me. And I was serious, I was like, can you, I was, I was you offended. You have no idea. But it was a good moment for me because I realized, you know, when I get a plan together and I've looked at everything, like, let's go. We're going. Get out of my way. We're moving. We're making this happen. Yeah, nobody rests until <laughs> it's moving. Yeah. And Ashley was like, well, Mom, there was that home improvement project where you guys were removing the shingles. You remember that? And we had this, like, good rhythm going. Jason was throwing down the shingles. I was grabbing them out. And, and I noticed he was kind of slowing down a little bit. And so I thought, I can, get, I can get one more load out. And I went down and caught a shingle to the head. And after uh, urgent care and three staples in my head, the kids actually got to do the rest of the work with bike helmets on. So I got out of that. <laughs> and then she's like, you know, Mom, there was also that time uh, when you took all the youth from family camp on the river and we got lost and we had to have people come get us and we missed dinner. That's the, all on you. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> or the time that we went hiking and Jared and I got poison oak because you took a shortcut. Also had nothing to do with that. Yeah. There's a theme here. There is a theme here that sometimes that when I have trouble waiting, right, it's hard for me and it's hard for everybody else in my company. Ever been there where God's asked you to wait and you're just like, God, this just doesn't make sense. How can this work out? I don't understand. You know, sometimes God has us waiting for further instruction. Sometimes there's a season of life we get to, and the Lord's just like, I want you to wait until I give more. And then I'm going to give you the next step, but I want you to wait, because there's something that you're going to learn in this moment that will prepare you for this next step. Sometimes it's to rest. Sometimes I've been working so hard, and, and I've been responding to the Lord, and, and I've been moving as he's called me to, and the Lord just says, okay, you've done your part, it's time for me. And that's why he's saying to Joseph, you need to rest, stand still. Other times, God may be doing something new in your life, where he's reorientating you in a different direction, a new pathway, and he says, I need you to wait, I need you to wait. Or at other times, it's to increase our faith. That God is doing something, and in that waiting process, you're growing. There's a strengthening coming for you. There's, there's an increase that's coming that's going to prepare you for the next moment, but you can't step into that moment yet. And there's this, this, this thing that says wait. How we wait is important. Are you waiting with expectation, or are you waiting with expectancy? Those are two different things. When we're waiting with expectation, it's we've got our, our hands on the wheel to say, and we're making all the decisions. We know how to get to this thing that we're getting to. And so we're calling the shots, and we put in all of this work and effort. And sometimes when things don't go as planned, it's like we can get that feeling of we're feeling cheated, that we're irritated or offended. God, I've been doing all this work for you. Why isn't this thing happening? Why aren't you blessing me this way? Or it can be at times where there's change that comes unexpectedly and change that, that feels like an interruption versus God's doing something. He's trying to tell me something. Mm -hmm. Many of us have these like unmet expectations that we're carrying around and they're toxic. 
And they're toxic because they were never from God to begin with. They were out of my grabbing and out of my forcing something instead of saying, God, what do you have for me in this moment? And God would say, would you come in with with expectancy? Expectancy is this hands open. It's this this stance of saying, Lord, I'm anticipating what you're going to do next. I'm excited. I'm looking for it. It's being open regardless of what you think should happen. That that you're walking in humility and accepting the fact that, you know what, I don't necessarily know how this thing is going to work out, but I know that I know that I know that God is for me. And when I know that God is for me, then I can walk with this open-handedness with God. I love what Alan Arnold said. He said this, he says, life is not meant to be something we control, but something we experience with God. I love that, that our life is meant to be experienced. It's meant to be this mysterious, beautiful journey that we partner with the living God and we can't go through holding on tightly. We've got to open our hands and go, okay, God, how are you moving? How am, I gonna, how am I seeing you move in this moment? And I'm going to step into that with expectancy. Why is this so critical? You know, this is so critical because this story was never about Jehoshaphat winning. It was never about him winning. It was God. God was saying to them, this victory is not dependent on you. It's dependent on me. You're not in charge of the outcome. I am. I think for some of us today, we've been carrying around a lot of things. And you've been working so hard and straining because you're convinced that the outcome is upon you. And God this morning would say to you, it's not up to you, the victory. This is the victory is mine. Would you step back and allow me to step in in this moment and wait and see what I will do? Waiting with him, working with him. Sometimes the Lord just says, you know what? You need to relax and let me step into this moment. Number three, when we know that God is for us, number three, we can rest secure in the waiting. The Bible's very clear and direct about what waiting looks like. In waiting, we're we're not waiting for an outcome. We're not waiting for a problem to be solved or even for restoration or healing to come. We are waiting on the living God. We're waiting on him. We're actually waiting on God himself to show up. And that's what I love about the story of Christmas. That's the season that we're entering into. It's the season of waiting, of saying, Lord, what are you doing? And how can I step into this moment with the living God? Hmm. Waiting is not just passive either right? When I'm waiting, I'm scanning, I'm looking, I'm listening to the Lord and listening for that voice. And the last thing he told me to, I'm being obedient to it. And as soon as I hear that new command, boom, I'm there and I'm stepping in and I'm joining him in that process. Have you ever had a moment where you look at your life and go, wow, God, I don't know how you did this, but it was just you. There's no other way. There's no other way that this could have happened besides your grace in my life. I know for Jason and I, there have been moments in our lives where we looked and go, there is no way that we are, that this is happening, that, that we're in this place of wholeness and health in our relationship other than the grace of God. And it is in that waiting process where we go, okay, Lord, I'm going to be expectant of you. I'm going to come with expectancy because you're in this moment, you're for me, and I can be secure in the waiting. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens next in the text as we draw this to a close. Watch watch where where, uh, Jehoshaphat goes next. 
<clears throat> then, uh, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of, of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken the counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and to praise him with holy attire. What's he do? He pauses before the battle has even begun and he appoints a choir. Okay, I don't know about you, but when I, when I was in high school and there was going to be like a scrap or a fight, the choir is not the place I would go to recruit. I would go to the wrestling team, I'd go to the soccer team, I'd go to the football team. But I'm not thinking of knocking on the choir door. But this is what Jehoshaphat does. He grabs the choir and they begin to establish singing in praise. Watch what happens. As they went before the army and they said, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And they began to sing praise, to sing and praise. And the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So what happens? They start having a fight with each other. They came to fight Judah, and the second they begin to worship, God causes confusion, and they start attacking to each other. And what happens? Then, jo then, then Jehoshaphat and the, and the army, who's standing there watching this, they show up to look to see the fight that's going to happen, and there's nothing but bodies that are everywhere. That's it. There's no, that's my kind of fight. That's my kind of fight. When I come to show up to fight, it's all done. And all it's just, now, now just, and now it's, and now it's just time to, to, get all the, to get all the spoils. And it took them, you read the text, it took them three days Three days of doing nothing but pulling in bounty from the victory. And the very battlefield that was supposed to be their point of destruction becomes the point of blessing. In fact, you read the rest of the text, what happens? They name the place Barakah, the Valley of Barakah, which is literally the Valley of Blessing. Come on. God took the very thing that the enemy and the adversary purposed to be their point of destruction and God turned it around, flipped the script and said, uh-uh, not on my watch. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> These are my people and you don't get to touch them until I say so. I will have the last word. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but for some of you, you're in the same place. You feel like you have been pushed back against the wall and the Lord would simply say to you, I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten you. And it's time to push back. It's time to push back. And I want to give us the opportunity this morning, before we close, to not just study the word. Studying the word is great. That's awesome. But let's act on it. Let's not just be seers, readers of the word. Let's be doers of the word. Because Joseph had understood something. He understood a powerful principle that the psalmist tells us, that God inhabits the praise of his people. That when we praise, and remember what's happening here. The battle hasn't even happened yet. They're giving praise in advance of the battle. They haven't seen the outcome. They let go of their expectation and God brought them to a place to simply stand expectant. The God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but God, we're going to trust you. Our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. See, when we forth respond in worship, it creates an atmosphere where God is able to move and do exceedingly abundantly. Well, wait a minute, aren't you putting limits on God? No, 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 I'm talking about an atmosphere. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus walks into his hometown and was only able to do a few things. Why? Because there was such an atmosphere of unbelief that was present. But worship does something. It reorients us. It says, God, I don't know how this is going to happen. But God, I'm trusting in your goodness and your character. And Lord, I'm releasing my expectation and simply coming 
Lord, do what only you can do. Would you stand with me? I want to invite you today. You're here with us in the house. You're online, online with us. And I want to invite you. You may be online and you're not excluded from this. Don't think you get to tune off and kind of put the computer away. Oh, they're going to do their... No, no, no. If you're here or you're there, either place, and you'd be honest enough to say, you know what? I feel like my back's against the wall. Maybe it's diagnosis. Maybe it's a relational situation. Maybe it's intergenerational patterns and curses that you feel like have just been chasing your family lineage down and it's an opportunity for us to stand and say, God, you are good and I am trusting you. I don't know how you're going to do this, but God, our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. And if that's you, I want to invite you. In a moment, the worship team is going to lead us in a simple chorus. And if that's you, I want to invite you to simply come forward and to take a posture in worship. And in so doing, make a declarative statement. God, I'm done. I'm looking to you. Would you come and do what only you can do? Would you move my heart? Would you move and align me? Would you move in this situation? Would you release the finances? Would you release health and wholeness? Would you change mindsets? Would you change generational patterns? God, would you do what only you can do? And if you're online... As we worship, I want to invite you. Some of you need to be stand in your living room. And you may look like a complete idiot, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make a difference. I want to invite you to simply stand and declare the goodness of God. Lead us, Marley.